Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Caldwell, and this is Add Some Swagger to Your Web APIs with Open API Specification. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, my Twitter is at Gabriel Caldwell, and the hashtag for the Open Source Summit is hashtag OSS, or, sorry, OS Summit. Uh, if you want to you know, send me a tweet or tweet something about the Open Source Summit, please feel free to do so. Uh, here is the agenda for today. Uh, so I'm going to switch things around a little bit. Uh, so first, I was going to tell you a little bit about me and then ask some questions about you. Um, but you know, if I ask some questions about you first, that might give some people a little bit of time to join. So uh, please uh, you know, use the Q&A function and uh, you know, let me know kind of some of the reasons why you wanted to join this session in particular and what you're hoping to get out of the session, and uh, kind of maybe about what you're interested in. Uh, so I can try to tailor the session a little bit more towards uh, you know, the majority of the people here, because not everyone's interested in uh, the same thing. And uh, you know, I'm doing live coding, which is always a bit uh, more interesting for some, less interesting for others. So, you know, uh, if you'd like to let me know kind of uh, what you're interested in, I can try and tailor it towards you and, you know, skip some things that maybe are not applicable or focus in on some other things that are a little bit more applicable. So, uh, again, for those of you who just joined, uh, please use the Q&A function. Just let me know, uh, you know, why you chose this session in particular and uh, what you're hoping to get out of the session. So, you know, I've seen a couple of... Um, People already use this function. Uh, one person said they like to document an in-house API. So perfect, you're in the right session for that. Um, and uh, yeah, if anyone else likes to, would like to use that Q&A function to well, let me know what you'd like to get out of the session, uh, we can do that. And I'll go back to the agenda now. So. Yeah, we're going to get to know a little bit about me. I'd like to get to know a little bit about you. And then we're going to talk about, uh, you know, open API specification, uh, .NET Core and open source, the difference the difference between documentation, specification, and definition. Uh, then we'll take a look at the NSWAG tool chain, uh, which, again, is specific to .NET, but don't worry. We're going to look at some alternative integrations uh, for your favorite language, your favorite framework. So if you're like, I'm Scala, ride or die, stick around. Uh, it's, <laughs> this is not just .NET. You know, we're talking about concepts here, so it's not specific to .NET or C Sharp. Um, yeah. So some people want to, one person said they, they've used the open API and they want to see how they can take advantage of that in their own API. Um, Someone likes Swagger, I like Swagger too, I'm a fan. Uh, so, all right, uh, let's get our swag on. So that's it for my slides, not a lot of slides. I, uh, I don't like to make slides usually when I present. I do a lot of in-person presentations and I, I find that you know if I make slides, there'll be a certain percentage of people that doesn't show up and they'll just download the slides and then we don't get the free beer or the free pizza or the swag, whatever is being offered time and then uh, you know we don't get to meet in person uh, which is kind of an important fun thing I can understand in these trying times so I don't meet in person but you know, that's why I don't want to make slides so I'm just going to start sharing my screen minimize the back end for this and uh, Close my browser. Uh, so there's my newborn son, Elliot. Uh, if something goes amiss during this presentation, let's just promise to blame sleep deprivation and not my own ineptitude. OK, thanks. <laughs> so let's open up the Edge browser. Uh, so on the topic of open source, uh, it's now based on uh, the Chromium open source project. Uh, so <laughs> pretty soon we're going to see some improvements to memory management in Chrome thanks to Microsoft, which is something I never thought I would ever say. Um, but uh, there we go. Uh, and one of the things that I found uh, really valuable since I don't make slides about Edge is this uh, collections uh, function of Edge. You can kind of create collections of websites. 
Uh, and that works really well with my workflow because, again, I don't make slides, but I need something to keep me on track about what I'm supposed to talk about. So uh, this is my collection for today. Uh, and one of the neat things is that you can you know, export all of the links uh, in the collection to Word or Excel, or you can copy all because you know, Word and Excel are not that useful. But uh, copy all is great because I could just make a text document with it. However, Microsoft, if you're listening, this particular one doesn't work. The other two work. This one works. Um, but uh, at the end of the session, I will copy all the links into a text document, and I will post them in the session abstract here. So you can get all the links that I talk about in the session abstract after the session. Another cool part about this collections thing is that I can add a note. Uh, remember to, to post links add that to my collection. So I'm going to do that. Um, all right, so there's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the CTO of Tsunami Solutions, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Tsunami Solutions, that sounds like a really old-timey company. No one names their company XYZ Solutions anymore. It's all like Bitly and Feedly and Safety Shark and Food Llama and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, yeah, it's true. We are an old-timey company. Um, been around since 1999, and uh, the idea behind the name was that you know we thought that mobile data was going to be the next big wave in computing, and it was going to be so big uh, that it would be like a tsunami. And I uh, guess what you know, we we're right. These are everywhere. Mobile data is uh, ubiquitous, um, and in fact, our product safety line. Uh, was the first uh, commercially available product to run on mobile data in the province of British Columbia, which is where we were based. When we were first, when we first started, there was no mobile data in British Columbia, uh, but uh, it was soon there, and we used this other old-timey thing uh, called Wireless Application Protocol, which, uh, if you look at Wikipedia, uh, there's multiple issues because, as with any type of ancient history, a lot of things get lost along the way. Uh, but let's start talking about um, open API specification and APIs in general. Uh, and this is where I usually ask uh, who's written an API, but I see from the Q&A that uh, you know, some people have written APIs before. Uh, and I'm just going to want to talk about, about the challenges of APIs. And you know, a lot of people have said that uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, with with APIs and writing the APIs, or even consuming APIs, is documentation. Uh, so I found this document, which is a, kind of an example of you know, commercially available API out there. So if you are here and you work for Garmin, I just chose you a random. There's nothing particularly wrong about this document. It's actually quite a good document. Um, but if you're a developer, you know, usually someone will hand you a document like this and will say, okay, here's uh, the Garmin API or here's API X, and uh, we need to, you know, consume this API for our product. We need to integrate with this API. So as a developer, you kind of read through this, you know, and what, what you're essentially doing is reading this documentation and trying to extract the specification from this document. And, and, and think about all of the different uh, possibilities uh, that might, you know, or different error codes that might happen. Different, you know, here we have the HTTP status uh, code. So you you know that okay, uh, this API is going to return success, 200 success if the API is working, or maybe if I didn't do something properly in my coding, uh, it's going to return 401 unauthorized because you know, I didn't uh, provide the proper. Uh, authentication token or what have you. Uh, so, but is this list exhaustive? That's kind of one of your questions. It's like, are these all of the status codes that the API might return? Um, maybe it returns more. I don't know, you know, you kind of do this uh, iterative process where you, you try different things against the API, you try different possibilities, you write all sorts of tests because you're curious about, you know, What's going to happen when I consume this API? Is my integration going to work? Uh, so this is a common common problem. And then again, on Garmin side, you know they have they have to you know someone has to write the API, and then they you know either write the documentation themselves as a developer, and we get bad documentation, 
or <laughs> I've made lots of that documentation. It's not a knock against you. Um, or uh, they, they hand it to like a technical writer and then the technical writer has to read the developer's mind and then create the documentation. There's a lot of back and forth between the developer and the writer of the documentation. And then someone will point out that, oh, there was a little, this was wrong or that was wrong. And then we have this whole revision history um, in the API. Uh, so these are some of the common problems that people run into. And uh, you know, there must be a better way. And of course, there is. So this is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, I'm going to use uh, .NET Core. Uh, and C-sharp and ASP.NET uh, core uh, to illustrate the concepts. But again, like I said, this is not something that's specific to .NET or C-sharp. So at the end, we're going to review some of the, the tools that are available for your favorite language or for your uh, favorite framework. So it's, we're just talking really about concepts. Um, but you know, hopefully some of you like .NET Core. Uh, it's open source, uh, which is, again, something uh, we never thought Microsoft would do. But look, there's .NET Core. It runs on Linux. Uh, I'm going to show you production API today that we have running on .NET Core uh, on Linux. Uh, so hopefully that interests you a little bit. Uh, so. Open API specification uh, is now here. It is a uh, Linux Foundation open source project. And uh, I know this session was labeled open source project update, but I do not work uh, on open API specification on the team, so I won't pretend to speak for them. Uh, if you're interested on in what's going on with the Open API initiative, you can visit this website. And again, I'm going to you know, post all the links in the session abstract at the end of this session. Uh, and if you're really interested, like I am, super fan, you might consider uh, visiting their GitHub. And if there's some improvement that you'd like to make uh, or uh, some feature you'd like to see in Open API specification, you can, yeah come here and let these uh, 36 other open pull requests and make a pull request on uh, the open API specification and maybe they'll look. Okay, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's jump into uh, Visual Studio now and take a look at uh, an API. So this is an API that I wrote probably 10 years ago, before there was uh, .NET Core, uh, before there was this, uh, before the open source movement really took hold in the world, before Microsoft saw the value of uh, open source. But I've kind of rewritten it uh, for ASP.NET Core to illustrate uh, some of the possibilities of open API specification and also to illustrate some of the problems that you run into um, with an API. Uh, I've stripped out uh, all of the authentication logic to kind of simplify it, but this is a real, this is real production code. This is running in production right now. Um, and you know, with your permission, I'd like to maybe take a segue and talk about what this API does. Since we're not, we're not using um, you know, a to-do API or some like simple like return cats API that people usually use in demos. We're using you know a real API. So uh, let's let's let me stop my sharing here for a little bit and see if everyone's okay with taking a small segue into learning about what this API does and why why we developed this API in the first place. Uh, so if you don't mind using the Q and A, uh, just Kind of letting me know if you're okay with uh, with um, you know taking a segue into learning a little bit more about what this particular API does and the problem that we are trying to solve with this API. Okay. All right. Sounds like we're good to go. Uh, so I will do that. I will share my screen again, and I will definitely keep it short. 
we have an hour together, so I think we have the time to get through everything that we are going to do. So I do have some slides because you know, 10 years ago, I did make slides. So uh, this API, uh, it, what it does is it works with LSD. And you know, you might be wondering to yourself, what is LSD? Well, it's not drugs. Uh, it's a le legal subdivision. And it's locating. Uh, it's a way of locating a piece of land in a specific to Alberta. So uh, earlier, I was talking about our product, Safety Line, which is a is a product that's designed to monitor the safety of people who work alone or in isolation, and it uses GPS. And uh, a lot of our customers were coming to us and saying, "Yeah, we like latitude, we like longitude, but can you give us LSD?" And we thought, like, what are you talking about? Why? Why would you want LSD? Everyone in the world uses latitude and longitude. Um, why would you want LSD? But you know, people kept asking for it and asking for it, and and I thought they were crazy. Uh, but after a while, you know, they keep asking for it. Uh, you say, okay, maybe we should give it to them. And I looked a little bit further into it, uh, and I found out some interesting things. So at first, I thought. Well, you know, you need to change what you're doing. You don't want ATS. You want GPS coordinates. You want a latitude and longitude. Like everyone knows where 27.17461780447 is, right? Um, but you know, it was a pervasive problem. It was an urgent problem, and the customer was willing to pay for it. So we thought, okay, let's let's figure out how this thing works and let's give it to them. Uh, so let's revisit that GPS coordinate. Does anyone know where? Uh, this coordinate is? I guess that no one knows, right? Because it's not really like latitude and longitude. It's good if you have the tools to plot that latitude and longitude on the map, but this is where it is, right? It's here. Um, and this is these are all the steps that you have to go through to actually find out where latitude and longitude is, other than you, know, you can type it into Google Maps and find out where it is. But if you're using a real map, this is what you would have to do. Um, turns out, in Alberta, they divided the province into a bunch of polygons. Um, and it works kind of like what you see here. It's divided into a section, township, range, and meridian. And what they've done is this amazing thing is that they've named all the roads after it. So the roads are actually maps. And it makes a lot of sense. If you tell someone like the ATS coordinates or the LSD coordinates, they know kind of like what corner that's on. If you give someone a latitude and a longitude, who knows where that is? But if you give someone in Alberta uh, the ATS coordinates, the Alberta Township System coordinates, they know where it is because the, the roads are named after it. So uh, to give our customers uh, those uh, ATS coordinates, we needed to uh, build an API to do that. Um, kind of interesting how you do that because you can't really just do math. You have to buy a shape file from the Alberta government and then create a spatial SQL database, and put all those coordinates in there, and then get all the polygons out. So this is an API to do that. Uh, so here's our controller. Uh, this is pretty standard if you're used to .NET. Uh, we have our data access. So it's a get, get the ATS descriptor for the coordinate that we've been provided from the query string. So if we run this API, let's take a second to build. That's one of my favorite presenters says, chugga, chugga, chugga. And here we have the API. And it's loading. And then we see a blank screen. And this is typical of a, of a you know, uh, a developer that's trying to take advantage of an API. They, they try the API endpoint and they go, huh, doesn't work. I don't know what what this is. Uh, it's supposed to work like this. Latitude equals 51. And longitude equals minus 112. And then here we go. We get the uh, LSD descriptor, the ATS descriptor. Uh, back from the API, but as a developer, how are you supposed to know that? You know, it's not very descriptive at the API endpoint. And if we go to um, the root or the, the the base of the URL, there's nothing. There's no information to be found there. So 
uh, you know, .NET lets us do this a little bit better. Um, and back in the old timey days, uh, if you were not building a web API, you would build like a library, and uh, that's how you create the documentation. So you go here, you go to build, and then you would make sure you checked off this XML documentation file, and you'd have your, your API document documented, you ship them to the library, and your documentation is done. But now, in the world of web APIs, you know, no one sees that XML documentation file. Uh, but, you know, ASP.NET Core allows us to do things a little bit better if we go to the model that the query string is trying to bind to. We can use this decorator. It says bind required on the latitude and longitude. Oh, sorry, that's the constructor. The latitude and longitude. And now, if we run the API again, and we didn't provide anything in the query string again, we get a little bit more informative answer back here that it's 400, we didn't provide the latitude and longitude, but are there other properties that we're supposed to be providing in the query string? I don't know, there's no documentation, this error message is not that informative. Um, so, you can also do these things uh, where you add an open API analyzer and how you do that is you edit the project file and you tell it here, add these open API analyzers and then if you try and build it, the compiler will tell you something. It'll say, okay, you're returning a status code here, 503, if, uh, for example, the database server is not available, you're returning a 503, but you never told anybody you're going to return a 503. So you can add this uh, decorator that says your API produces this particular response type. It's going to return an okay, 200, it's going to return uh, 503, service unavailable. Um, and that's based off what the controller does. It's also uh, just by, it's going to, this is just if we want to go really in depth into uh, ASP.NET Core, it's also going to return, uh, it's going to return this bad request as well. If you don't provide anything in the query string we saw, it's also going to return this bad request. So let's make sure we put that bad request in there. And our API is getting a little bit better, right? We're telling whoever's trying to consume this API, these are all the possible status codes that are going to be returned from the API. But, you know, we're still missing documentation. We're still missing that specification in, in our API. So we can do a little bit better. Uh, and this is what we're going to talk about the NSWAG tool chain, which is a way to add the open API specification to your ASP.NET APIs. But, like I said, um, we're just talking about some concepts here, and we're going to take a look at some of the other tools that are available for adding uh, open API specification to your API. Uh, so what you would do is you go and manage your NuGet packages, and you go and install this particular NuGet package here, the ASP.NET uh, and swag.asp.net core. Oops, go back to management NuGet packages. Browse, install that package. It's going to bring in all the dependencies. And uh, this NSWAG, by the way, is an open source project. Uh, you can find it here. Uh, and if there's something that you'd like to see in this project at the end of the presentation, something that uh, you think would be really valuable, again, you can make a pull request. Uh, you can file an issue. You can do all those types of things uh, because it is open source. So we just need to wire up a couple more things here to make this API really cool is go to our startup.cs and we go to where all the services are registered and 
we register this service that has to do with Swagger. And then we're also going to provide Swagger UI. Uh, so Swagger UI is another open source project. Um, and it's actually made by the people who originally started API specification. And uh, now they've moved on to a company called SmartBear, which makes a lot of tools uh, for an open API specification. So yeah, you can find them here at swagger.io. And you can see, uh, so this is a fair copy of the open API specification. but. You can see that they have a lot of API development tools uh, specifically relating to Swagger. And I would definitely encourage checking them out because they make a lot of really, really cool tools uh, for inspecting your APIs and building your APIs, testing your APIs. Uh, so it's a really, really useful resource. OK, so uh, now that if we fire this thing up, We're going to, again, get that 400 because we haven't provided anything uh, in the query string. But if we go to the base URL, now we get this Swagger UI. So the Swagger UI um, has a couple things here. It has a link to the swagger.json file. And what the swagger.json file is, is the specification for your API. So we've used the NSWAG tool chain to inspect the code and automatically generate uh, the specification for your API. So what it's doing here is uh, it's telling us about uh, the parameters that are expected. It's expecting this latitude, this longitude. Uh, it's expecting this is unknown. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about there that as well. So this is basically the model that it's expecting to bind to into query string. And then here's all the, the possible response codes. We have 200, 400, 503. So it's basically inspected the code that we've written and provided a, a specification for your API. And the Swagger UI also allows you to try out the API. So we can try out the API here. Uh, what I'd like to show you a little bit more about where all of this is coming from. So it's saying that. You know, you can provide the latitude, you can provide the longitude, and it's giving you some hints. So uh, where are all these hints coming from? So let's close this. And all of these hints are coming from the comments that you've made in your code. So some of the documentation for your API is now coming directly from your code. And that's why, uh, and to get that, that functionality, you definitely have to go to to the build panel here and uh, check off this XML documentation file because what NSWAG is doing is it is uh, inspecting that XML documentation file and it's pulling out all of your comments and then, then it's providing them to the Swagger UI. But there was another thing in there that we were, we were looking at is that that is unknown property and that's because um, the model that we're using for the API has a latitude and longitude, but it also has this is unknown property, which is a, a calculated property. So maybe you don't want to expose that. And there's a way to stop that from being exposed uh, in your specification and in the Swagger UI. You can just add this decorator, open API ignore. And then now this is not exposed in your specification file or in your in your uh, Swagger UI anymore. We can go back and take a look at that Swagger UI. Once it goes to the Take a look at that. And we can now try out our API. So click this try out button. Let's try it. One, let's try to suggest it minus 112. We execute, and we see we got a uh, response 200 back. Uh, this is the ATS descriptor for that particular latitude and longitude, uh, and it's pulling out all of the the the, uh, the XML comments that you have um, provided in your code to do this. Uh, and you see we have a little bit of a, a description of the API as well here. So. 
if you wanted to, uh, you could expand on this and you could provide some more comprehensive documentation in your Swagger UI here uh, to really just kind of make it a one-step process in terms of like coding your API, creating the documentation, and providing the specification to um, anybody that wants to consume your API. And if we go back to my notes here, they're supposed to keep me on track. Uh, there's some other interesting things that you can add to your auto-generated document. So besides what's there, um, you can add some terms of service to your, to your API. Uh, you can add some contact info. You can even add a license to your API. Um, we can take a look at what that looks like here. So hopefully in your mind you're saying, uh, Gabriel, this like seems really simple. Why are we uh, attending a uh, session about this? Well, it is really simple <laughs> if you know what to do, right? Uh, and this is really, really powerful. Um, it's super powerful. It takes a lot of the pain points out of developing an API, documenting an API, or if you're a developer consuming the API. Uh, I hope that you find some value in it. Uh, I also showed in the session abstract that we are going to have some fun time permitting. So I think we have lots of time left in the session. So we're going to, we're going to do some more fun things. Uh, but I would like to kind of stop sharing my screen for a little bit and jump into the Q&A. So hopefully you have some questions about um, what I've just shown you. And maybe we can go into a little bit more detail on some of the things that I've shown you. Uh, or I can you know, just answer your question. So please use the Q and A uh, Sorry, use the Q and A function to to ask some questions if you have some questions. If not, I can. Don't worry. Don't have to have questions. Maybe I did my job. Um, and uh, we can just jump into some more fun things that kind of show you the power of building uh, Open API specification into your API. So just give people uh, maybe another 30 seconds or so to, to put your comments in there or questions in there. OK. Um, like I said, uh, we uh, will also take a look at some of the, the tools that are available for your favorite language and for your favorite framework. So uh, let's take a look at those now. And again, uh, all the links will be in the session abstract at the end of the session because I will definitely remember to do that and put them in there. Okay. So we'll go back here and here are. You know what? Yes, here they are. Okay. So also, this is from. So it's not there. Does not the correct label, uh, but uh, at this URL you can see some of the other tools that are available uh, to for your favorite language, your favorite framework, and please feel free to go through that list. As you can see, it's quite exhaustive. Whatever, uh, whatever you're into, whether you're into Java, JavaScript, Lua, TypeScript, .NET, Node.js, there's tons and tons of tools out there for you to add open API specification or uh, take advantage of uh, an API that has open API specification. So let me just jump back to the Q&A here for a sec, see if we have any questions now. OK, great. Uh, show you some of the more powerful things that you can do once you've added uh, open API specification to your API. So this is a, another uh, tool uh, by the same person that developed uh, the NSWAG tool chain, RicoSuiter. And again, this is the GitHub. Uh, this is called NSWAG Studio. 
So this is a way that you can automatically generate a client, uh, which is, you know, something that uh, is, a, again, like we saw at the beginning, a common task. Someone will hand you a documentation for an API and say, we need to consume this API. Please uh, write a client for that API. And you have all those pain points that we've talked about. Uh, but if I'm running this API here, again, go to the base URL once it loads up. I can get my API specification file, get that swagger.json file on the path to that. And in uh, NSWAG Studio here, I can just paste in uh, the URL for the specification file and I could say, okay, maybe I want a C-sharp client or maybe I want a TypeScript client. Let's just take a look at the C-sharp client here. Uh, you can go using this tool, uh, probably the only thing you really care about, there's many, many options on how you want to generate the client, but uh, where you want to do is go all the way down to the bottom and um, specify the path for your API. So let's just put it on my desktop. All good files go. So if we hit generate output here, what happens is the NSWAG toolchain goes and takes a look at that swagger.json file, understands the specification, and automatically generates the C sharp client here for us. So I'm going to expand this a little bit. We can see it's written my entire client for me. My job is done. I can just go home. Um, and here's an interesting thing is that there is uh, a REST API for JIRA, which is one of the biggest tools out there. They also support uh, open API specification. So if we look at their uh, open API specification document, it's much more comprehensive. They've built a lot of a lot of the they built a lot of the documentation into the specification as well. Uh, but we could just copy this URL here. Uh, we can do the same thing. Uh, Add in there uh, for the C sharp client. Go back to settings. And let's just rename this here to Jira client and generate the output. It'll probably take quite a while because Jira client is uh, very, 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 very complicated, and so is the API, of course. Uh, not sure how long it'll take here. But eventually, what will happen is we will have a Jira client automatically generated. Ah, so here it is. So we have this very, very comprehensive client for the Jira API. This is weeks and weeks and weeks of work for a developer done instantly through the magic of open API specification. Uh, so again, this is if you build Swagger into your or open API specification into your API. Uh, you're providing a lot of value for anyone that consumes that API, and you're saving them a lot of time. And I'll show you some of the, uh, some more powerful things that you can do with it as well. But I'll quickly jump back to the Q and A to see if anybody has any questions about uh, what I've talked about so far. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, let us jump back in. So, uh, one of the other things I won't show you today that I'll, I'll, that you can also do with the NSWAG toolchain is that you can, it supports MS, whoops, sorry, I stopped sharing unintentionally. Let's do that. Okay. Is that it supports MS build arguments. So, uh, what you can do is you can um, go back to Visual Studio. Is that you can have a client project for your API, and then have that client regenerated every time you make a change to the API. And if you build that into your DevOps pipeline, you can have the client regenerated and published every single time that you make a change to your API, which again saves so much time, uh, and it's very very powerful. 
And in case anyone's wondering, uh, the Unswipe toolchain and OpenAPI specification in general also supports API versioning, right? So if you have an API that's been around for a long time or you've made a new API but you want to keep it around for a long time and there's going to be new versions in the future, don't worry. Uh, API, open API specification supports versioning and you'll be able to try different uh, versions of that API in the uh, Swagger UI tool that I was showing you earlier. Okay, so, uh, all right, what shall we do here now? Maybe I'll show you some of the kind of the powerful things that you can do if you have an API that supports Swagger. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go into Microsoft Forms here, and I'm going to just make it, you know, stay with me here. You might think, why is this guy going into Microsoft Forms? It doesn't make any sense. But let's say, uh, for example, I was uh, like a wildlife service uh, in Alberta, and I wanted to make a tool uh, that would allow people to report, uh, you know, kind of wildlife in Alberta. And, uh, and then send someone to go check out that wildlife spotting report. And so I can make this uh, report survey. And I can add a new question. Uh, let's see what latitude did you see the wildlife at? And what longitude did you see the wildlife at? So it's adding those. Order what latitude that one required, and then that one required, and that's it. And I'm going to be tab here, and I'll go into another tool uh, called, called Power Automate. And Power Automate is kind of similar to if this, then that. You can create kind of uh, custom business processes based on something happening. Uh, so if I was Alberta Wildlife Services, uh, I, w I might want something to happen uh, when someone makes a new wildlife report through that form that I've created. So I can name this call. It's called a Wildlife Report. that and then when someone makes a wildlife report I will go get that oops I will get those response details from this one this and once I have that then this is the amazing part is that we can go here uh, and add in a Swagger API call if we want to. Uh, so what we could do is we could take that latitude and longitude from the uh, wildlife report and we could convert it into ATS coordinates and then provide it to someone that is uh, responding to that wildlife report. And this is all without writing any code. We can make that API call because uh, we have that uh, open API specification on our API. So I'll show you how this works. Uh, one thing I need to do is um, I need to start this ngrok tunnel so that I can expose the API that's running on my local machine to the internet. And uh, if you're not familiar with ngrok, it's it's an amazing tool. So I don't want to leave this place because I need to come back there. Uh, it's an amazing tool, uh, and this is exactly what it does. It's a public URL for exposing your local web server, and uh, it works on. Mac OS, Windows, Linux, FreeBSD. So uh, if you're not familiar with this tool, it's an amazing tool. Uh, so what I have now is I have this URL, this ngrok URL that's exposing my API that's running locally on my machine. So I run that. Make sure it's running. Go back to Power Automate. And I can put in URL for my API specification. Next. Oh, let's see. Ah, yes, we forgot to do something. Course, the bane of all developers. 
so we just have to enable cores. And since we have, uh, since this is a public API, we have no problem just letting anyone make a request. So just make sure that we enable cores here. Security people are probably going crazy. So, you know, this may not apply to your API. So make sure that you don't just copy and paste the code and add cores to any, or at least allow anybody to make a request via cores to your API. But now the API is running. Go back to Power Automate, that Swagger file. And now that we've seen that Power Automate is picking up, uh, all of the documentation and the specification for the API. We can see here it is. It's a description of this integration that returns an API, API a sort of ATS descriptor, the latitude and longitude. And what we can do here now is that we can provide uh, the answers to the questions. So if someone puts in the latitude and someone puts in the longitude to that wildlife report survey that we created. Now we can take that. Uh, we can make an API request to it. Let's just save that so we don't lose it here. So quote saving. And then we can dispatch someone to make a, an inspection of that, uh, those particular coordinates. So let's just uh, go and open my email because you'll probably see all the emails from my mom telling me to eat my broccoli. So I've made this um, email baby wildlife services at gmail.com. Put in here new wildlife port. And the content in the email there is wildlife at ETS. And we have the response body here from the call to um, the uh, API to get the ATS descriptor, and boom. Now we've created a business process where someone is able to, through this form here, report some wildlife, and then we're able to dispatch someone via email with the ATS coordinates of that wildlife. Uh, now, uh, we can see that in action, but I won't use this survey because it's linked to that one that I that Power Automate flow that I just created, and uh, it doesn't actually work when you're running uh, on localhost. Um, Microsoft doesn't like that. Not with good reason, because it's probably not going to be sticking around too long unless you buy that Pro NROC uh, subscription. Uh, so we can go try this one, this prod wildlife report and preview it and try it out. Uh, so let's say I uh, first let's open that Alberta Wildlife Service email account. See there's nothing in there. And then I'm going to respond uh, to my wildlife report here. I'm going to put in coordinates of where I saw some wildlife, submit that. And then now Alberta Wildlife Services is going to get an email in the inbox saying, Okay, there's a new wildlife report. Wildlife has been spotted at this particular latitude and longitude, and there's the ATS descriptor. So now, as someone that needs to respond to this, uh, I can go out and I have the ATS coordinates. And as we saw in the original presentation, it's baked right into the road, so I don't even need to open Google Maps, open Google Maps. I know exactly where that is, and I can go. So these are some of the really powerful things that you can do if you add open API specification to your API. And again, these are some of the, the, the tools that are available out there to do that. So it's not just for C-sharp or ASP.NET Core. It's available for your favorite language, your favorite framework. Um, and I, yeah, I'm a big fan. I hope you're now a big fan as well and that you add it to, to your APIs. And I'll stop sharing and jump back in for any questions. And hopefully I can provide some answers. looks like uh, we have reached the end of the session. So thanks, everyone, for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and please tweet me if you have any other questions. And 
I hope to see you using OpenAPI specification in your API soon. Thanks.